Today, I have the founder of Libertas Institute, the author of 29 books. They've sold over 2 million copies. Welcome, Mr. Connor Boyack, to the show. Thanks for having me. We basically change hearts, minds, and laws in favor of a freer society. What do you think are the principles or values that lead to individual success? If you find a way to solve problems that other people have, they will reward you for it. What I've seen be more effective even than education and knowing information is execution. We need to wise up, we need to suit up, and we need to step up. It ultimately boils down to the wise words in the Declaration of Independence that I think too few people read. Everyone focuses on the Constitution, which I think is kind of the letter of the law, if you will, and the spirit of that same law is the Declaration independence. The government exists to secure our rights, not to provide benefits or create rights. There are pre-existing rights, unalienable rights, that the government has to recognize and protect. Why do you think that politicians are always suited up? We judge books by their cover. We might say we don't want to, we might say that's a bad idea, but the outward appearance is an indicator, it's a signal. Community and national success, I think this is really a place where you can offer some wisdom. All right, today I have a very special person with me. He's the founder of Libertas Institute. He's the author of 29 books. Uh, they've sold over 2 million copies. The Salt Lake Tribune described him as someone who can get things done by seemingly lifting a finger. He's a husband, father, and I also hear he's a beekeeper. Indeed. Um, so I'd like to welcome Mr. Connor Boyack to the show. Thanks for having me. The pleasure is mine. Um, so I'm a big fan of your books. I'm a fan of your cartoon. I'm also a fan of this necktie that you have on. Thanks. Uh, is there a story behind the tie or just like the color purple? I, I tend to not, so growing up I always wore white shirts, you know, for my church and everything, and I've kind of gotten into this phase of wanting to not wear white shirts anymore, kind of this rebel, I guess, from my early years or whatever. So I've had to go to solid color ties, whereas previously it was always the patterns and the fun stuff to then go with a white shirt. So I've got a whole, you know, collection of just these simple, solid colors so that I can wear fun, nice. fun shirts and have a little, have a little fun with it. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about style later on, but first I want to get to know you a little bit. Sure. So I first came into contact with your work when my wife was reading a book series to my kids, uh, the Tuttle Twins, and I'd imagine this is some of the more popular books that you've written. Yeah. Uh, what's the backstory on the Tuttle Twins? So uh, I started um, this organization, the office of which we're sitting in right now, Libertas Institute, about a decade ago. And we basically change hearts, minds, and laws in favor of a freer society. And after doing that for a few years, I found myself wanting to help my kids understand what I do all day. At the time, they were young still. They were five and three. But still, I, at least for the five-year-old, I wanted to give him some sense of like what dad does all day when he's gone. And uh, so I did what any dad in my shoes would do. I went on Amazon to try and find a book that would explain like free market ideas or property rights or things like that and came up short. And at the time, I had been talking with a buddy of mine, Elijah, who's now our illustrator. And uh, he had young kids too, and he also wanted to teach them these ideas. So we teamed up on a book. And it was just a fun little side project, a little test to see, you know, if it would uh, be viable or interesting to people. And sold a ton of copies and really kind of tapped into this void, I guess, that a lot of other parents were like, I want my kids to learn these values as well. I want them to learn about entrepreneurship and hard work and the golden rule and all these things. And there's not really any literature out there that focuses on this. And so that to us was a, kind of a signal of sorts to say, let's keep this going, let's do more books, and then we haven't uh, turned back since. Well, it's obviously been successful. Um, is there any Dr. Seuss connection? There's a line in the Dr. Seuss book that says, the 10 tired turtles on the Tuttle Tuttle tree. Any Oh no, I didn't even know there? about that. Uh, the answer is kind of more boring but strategic. When uh, We knew we wanted to do a boy and a girl so that both boys and girls could uh, relate to one of the main characters. So. Then we said, well, twins is going to be the easiest thing to do, and a boy and a girl twin. And, uh, and we liked the idea of doing a last name with a T so that we'd have some alliteration. And we want it to be only one or two syllables so that young kids... So I just basically came up with a list of the most popular 
you know, last names with a T. And then I started going through, is the .com available? Do I like this name? Does it roll off the tongue easily? Narrowed it down to like two or three. And ultimately we picked Tuttle Twins just because the website was available. There wasn't anyone famous, you know, with that name. So the Google search rankings would work in our favor. Um, so it was more of kind of a strategic marketing thing than a, a wow. nod to Dr. Seuss or anyone. Well, I love the alliteration of the T sound. I have an idea for you uh, on a book. The Tuttle Twins teach teens to tie ties. We could like All right. collab this. Or... <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, actually, you may like this one. The Tuttle Twins teach tea partiers to tie ties. <laughs> well, we, we definitely want to tap into our audience. And many of the tea, parter, tea partiers uh, need some style lessons. So that may not be a bad thing to do. Well, they need to tune in because we'll have a, a, hopefully a couple of those later on. Um, so my first personal contact with your work was the Tuttle Twins cartoon, and I loved it. Uh, in fact, I loved it so much I ended up investing awesome. in it. So Thank I you. was one of the early investors. Uh, what's the backstory there? How did that become the number one crowdfunded cartoon series in history? So after doing the books for a while, we were starting to see that there was a lot of interest, and this was a growing kind of media you know, project. And Elijah and I wanted to do a cartoon. Uh, his background is in kind of animation and, and, and so forth. And so he actually put together like this little 30 second uh, simple clip that I then used to try and go out and raise funds for and do on our own and failed miserably. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, nor did I have any anticipation of how, how much effort would have to go into uh, a project like that. And so at the time uh, I was talking with some uh, friends of mine, the Harmon Brothers, which is they're a very kind of well-known marketing agency, and they had a company, Vid Angel, and now it's Angel Studios, and they were the distributors and company behind The Chosen, which is a very well-known um, Christian media project right now. And they were trying to say, okay, what's our next project going to be, and how do we kind of continue the success and build our own portfolio of high-quality family content? And, uh, and so, and all their kids have read the books. They're all like-minded. The, they've all been Tuttle Twins fans for years. And so when they heard that we were looking to do a cartoon and they were at the you know, point of wanting to look for more projects to do, it just kind of resonated where we started talking and uh, basically created a joint collaboration where the Harmon brothers would produce the cartoon with all their kind of comedic writers and, and, and so forth. And then Angel Studios would distribute the cartoon and then we'd be involved just to make sure there's brand consistency, we're teaching all the same ideas, um, and then it's part of kind of this broader Tuttle Twins initiative. And so we're really excited and uh, especially excited by how high quality it's turning out and how good the comedy is, both for like, it's like those cartoons where it's for the adults and the kids, there's like that different level of humor for uh, everyone in the whole family, and so it's looking like we're going to be able to deliver on that that promise of creating kind of this family show that everyone's going to enjoy watching together. It, actually, one of my lifelong dreams was to invest in animated shows that teach good principles and values. Well, there you go. So when I saw that, I was like, "Wow! Like, how could I not do this? It's such an easy first investment." Cool. Um, and I was really excited to see the first episode, and then you guys launched the second round of funding. So I was like. Well, I'm going to have to invest again or else face dilution, right? Any good <laughs> angel investor. So I, I just have to say well played on <laughs> the second investment there. But it, was, it was fun for us too because we had, I think, over 6,000 people invest. And, and the minimum was $100, as you remember. And so it, it opened it up to a wide range of people to participate. But for us, it was awesome because our own community who already knows and loves the material could participate in helping us build this new project. And, uh, and so rather than going out to some fat cat investor that, you know, just cares about the money, we had people investing, you know, thousand, five, ten, twenty-five thousand, while also telling us, I don't care if I ever make my money back, I just want to see this cartoon be produced for my kids. Yeah. Um, and so it was very validating to see people who are very committed to the, the project and, and we think they're going to love what we're doing. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, I'm hoping to get the money back so I can reinvest. Uh, it's, it's a long-term strategy and a life goal for me. So. Sure. Now, you've been written about since you were young. Several years ago, my wife was raving about a parenting book, um, <laughs> and she told me some of the ideas. I was like, those are great ideas. Uh, it turns out it was uh, a book written by your mother, I think, and you uh, you are featured in 
in the book several times. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are good and bad things that came to your life because of that. Any come to mind that you talk about it? Um, yeah, that, that book, uh, The Parenting Breakthrough, was my mom's first book. It's funny, my mom had written, I don't know, a dozen or I think she was up to 20 books or something. And so as I started writing my own books, uh, there was a little bit of competition because I wanted to beat her, which I now have. Uh, and also it was, you know, she's a proud mom, obviously, even if her son, you know, has put out more content than she has. But it was funny, um, this is a, a brief tangent, but she, we grew up in San Diego. And uh, she was back home and ran into, what was it? I think my like sixth grade English teacher, or eighth grade or something like that. And, oh, how's Connor? And I'm like, okay, well, if your eighth grade English teacher remembers who you are, that can actually be a really good thing or a really bad thing if, you know, she happens to remember a specific student like that. And so my mom, at the time, I think I had written like a dozen books or so. Oh, he's written a dozen. And her mind was just blown. Like, how could this kid, like, I, was, I hated English. I did poorly in it, like. For her, it was kind of a, a, a mind explosion that I've, I've done this. My mom, my parents, but my mom especially, uh, w was a very intentional mother. Um, I think, especially myself as a parent, you know, it's hard. We're busy. Kids are being pulled in different directions. They're getting exposed to all kinds of stuff. Like, we're busy. We're tired at the end of the day. Like, it's hard to be very intentional. My mom was explicitly intentional. At, at this age, I want you to learn this, you know, type of stuff and really uh, trying to help me and my brothers gain uh, knowledge and independence as soon as possible and be able to, you know, clean all these different things or know how to open a checking account or, or change a tire and like all the stuff that you want a 18 year old when you kick him out of the house to be able to do. But starting with this list, she provides this in the book of like, okay, when they're, you know, three and five and six, seven, like all the way up, like here are the different things. And so parents will love it because they're like, here's an action plan and here's something that I can kind of follow rather than trying to think up on my own what to do. So we were kind of the guinea pigs for that. And uh, she refined it over time. So I was the initial guinea pig that she had to like, you know, <laughs> test with before refining for my three younger brothers. Um, and, uh, but no, it was, it was fun for me. Like looking back, it was, it was nice because you see today how many millennials and others complain about adulting and can't do just basic stuff. And to me, more broadly speaking, I think our society is um, doomed if you've got a bunch of incompetent individuals who not only for their own sakes can't uh, function properly, but then have the power of voting and controlling what the rest of us do. Uh, and so, you know, ignorance and incompetence and all those things I think are a big problem that our school system and so many of our family structures are not adequately you know, supporting these kids as they get older. So for me, it was nice to just come out of that family um, environment and feel equipped for life and able to make smart decisions and move forward rather than not know what to do. Yeah. Well, I've looked into a couple of the laws you passed, like for instance, the sandbox law, the lemonade stand law, mm -hmm. the free range child law. Mm. Um, so. I'm seeing a theme here. Are you sure there's nothing unresolved about your childhood that mm -hmm. you'd like to, to resolve? <laughs> Maybe therapy would, uh, <laughs> would, would produce something like that. Yeah, we, we uh, I mean, with the Tuttle Twins, right? Like, to me, the rising generation is, is something that requires a lot of attention and investment. And in part, I, I have this focus on, on the youth because I feel like we've long neglected them. For those like me who are more conservative, um, a lot of families entrust their kids uh, most formative years to a school system that is predominantly filled with left-leaning you know teachers and others and that's you know fine the difference of opinion or whatever but a lot of these parents don't realize that that's what's happening don't realize that their children are maybe going to be taught as truth some different ideas that they might want to you know counteract or or teach differently I think of it like this like so many organizations like mine or vote, you know, trying to persuade voters and all that stuff, we wait until these people are adults um, and we leave it up to the schools to do whatever the schools do. And then, oh, when they're 18, when they're older, we'll talk to them about these ideas that, that are going on in the world and whatnot. And I just think that's a disservice to kids. You, you see these videos all the time of like high school seniors being interviewed and asked basic civic questions that they can't get right at all. And it's like if the product of our public schools is ignorance, um, especially civic illiteracy, then what does that mean for our society as a whole? And so that's why, you know, whether the laws or the Tuttle Twins books or our entrepreneurship programs and everything that we do for youth, it's really, from my perspective, designed to say, you know, we need to invest in the rising generation 
and help these kids be adequately prepared, just like I guess my mom did for me. Uh, I want to do more for the kids and, and serve them so that they can be more competent, engaged, and informed adults. Hmm. So who were so speaking of childhood, who were you when you were middle school, high school? If we knew each other uh, on the playground, who who were you growing up? I was a shy introvert that played the saxophone in band and uh, did horribly in sports and cheated in school because I was lazy and saw that as a path to taking a shortcut towards uh, getting the grades I needed to not make my parents upset. You said eighth grade, right? Is that the high, uh, middle school, high school, there? yeah. Oh, I mean, middle school for everyone is horrible, so <laughs> I was awkward yeah. as all get out. Um, I agree. I played pogs in eighth grade. Nice. <laughs> Those were big. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, even in high school, I was kind of the dorky uh, marching band kid. I was a late bloomer, uh, so I didn't hit puberty till like middle of my junior year. So I was a short, little, immature kid. Um, huh. And you could not pay me enough money to go back and relive those years. I'm glad to, to be past <laughs> that. So Yeah. We all, we all grow up sometime, and it's, yeah. it's a good thing for most of us. Um, well, I guess some people don't ever grow up, honestly. Truth. The, is the truth that... Physically they grow up, but yeah. <laughs> otherwise. So I heard you say in an interview that uh, when you were dating your wife, you, uh, you had her reading libertarian books. Is that true? Any backstory there? Um, less libertarian books and more... Like there was one in spe uh, specifically by John Taylor Gatto, who was a former 30-year um, public school teacher in New York. And he wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down, uh, The Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Education, which from his perspective lays bare kind of all the problems with government schools and how they can be counteracted by intentional parents that want to provide a better educational experience for the kids. This guy is no like anti-public school person. He, he w in the very year that he won the New York State Teacher of the Year, which was like in his 29th or 30th year, he, uh, so whole state, it's like the PTA or the union or whatever, right? It's like the system is saying, here's our top teacher. Um, he quit that same year by writing an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal titled, I Quit, I Think, in which he goes on to say how he was hurting children more than he was helping them because of the deficiencies of the system and the problems that they cause. And so I had her read that book, my, my then fiance, because I wanted this other path for my children. I didn't want to subject them to the same kind of process and all of its problems. And so that was me trying to get her on board of like, hey, this is a two-part decision. Like, you're going to have to be on board with this whole homeschooling or alternative education thing. Um, and there were other like more libertarian-ish type of books, like one by Ron Paul and an economic book. But I didn't really, you know, insist that she read that. More just like, hey, look, here are my beliefs and opinions. Do we jive with that? And so we had a lot of conversations about that stuff. Uh, but it was specifically that Dumbing Us Down educational book that I wanted to make sure she read so that I would know if she kind of shared those same values and, and concerns. So as they get, get on the same page, make sure that she, you're a good fit for her value, her right. core values. I had to see if she would pass the test. <laughs> well, I heard that it was uh, libertarian books, and I, was, I thought that was pretty impressive that you wooed your wife with 19th century <laughs> economic texts. I have a, a, an idea for another book, if, if that is the case. I want to hold your invisible hand. Unusual but effective dating tips for political people. I love it. That's great. That's great. That would sell a lot of books. <laughs> because these econ nerds need dating tips. They need dating help. So that'd, that be, is, that'd be great. That is true. All right. So we're going to jump into the meat and potatoes of the interview. That, that was just kind of getting to know you. Um, the next part of the interview is going to be wise up, suit up, and speak, uh, step up. So that's our mission at My Nice Tie, is, uh, and that's our call to ourselves as well as to our community, is we need to wise up, we need to suit up, and we need to step up. Um, and we'll go through each one of those sections, but wise up is all about the values, principles, and attributes that lead to successful individuals, communities, and nations. And you can uh, probably guess why we wanted to interview you on this topic. Um, so first of all, what do you think are the principles or values that lead to individual success? You've seen some success in your career. You're likely going to see a lot more. Uh, what do you think are the values or principles that can benefit somebody uh, mm. in our audience? I mean, education is, is critical. I think you have to know your stuff, whatever industry you're in, and, and put in the effort to, to learn the ropes. But what I've seen be more effective even than education and knowing information is execution. 
I see so many people in my career industry, if you will, um, and elsewhere who are knowledgeable, they went to school, they read books and so forth, but they lack any execution ability. And so if we're talking specifically in the context of success, and actually, excuse me, trying to achieve success, I think execution is what matters more than education. Uh, I know people who have a, a modest education, or I wouldn't consider them you know, intellectual by any degree, but they're hustlers, and they're people people, and they know how relationships work and how they can negotiate. They have a lot of those soft skills um, that can really benefit you. So I, I think learning how to execute, learning how to negotiate, learning how to, like as I think about professional success and entrepreneurship, to me, it boils down to service. I think all entrepreneurship is service. The kid that mows my lawn or does, you know, pulls the weeds for me or whatever, that's service. That's, I see that as a benefit so that I don't have to do those things. I would rather part with 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever, right? Jeff Bezos dropping something off the day after I order it, like, that's amazing to me. I don't have to go to the store anymore and waste time commuting and stuff. So all entrepreneurship, I think, is service. You're creating value for other people. And so success in life, I think, whether you're a kid with a lemonade stand or a paper business, not that those exist anymore, uh, or babysitting for people or whatever you're doing in your youth to the variety of careers we have as options as adults, to me it all centers around how are you creating value for other people. If you find a way to solve problems for other people, this is something I keep trying to teach my kids. If you, if you find a way to solve problems that other people have, they will reward you for it. You don't have to be entrepreneurial. You don't have to know how to do business. You don't know how to do all these things and you know, manage finances and everything else. Focus on identifying what problems people have and how you can solve them for them. And everything else will just unfold and, and fill in the gaps along the way. Um, I think that's where success really lies in being good problem solvers and then having the execution ability to go solve those problems. I agree. I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm getting paid for it, so it's not service. I don't think that's true. I think, you know, we, if, if we're getting paid is a really good example that your service is extremely appreciated. Mm -hmm. Now, there are situations where we need to reach out to the people who are less fortunate and stuff like that. And we'll actually talk a little bit more at the end of this interview about that. But I, I totally agree. So let's move on to um, community and national success. I think this is really a place where you can offer some wisdom for us, help us wise up in a sense. Uh, what do you think are the foundational principles of our nation or a successful nation? I, I think it ultimately boils down to the wise words in the Declaration of Independence that I think too few people read or ponder how they apply in our day. I think that document is completely spot on and totally inspired. Everyone focuses on the Constitution, which I think is kind of the letter of the law, if you will, and the spirit of that same law is the Declaration of Independence that produced the opportunity to create the Constitution. You know, Thomas Jefferson and others, when they were working on it, talking about life, liberty, and what eventually became pursuit of happiness, uh, traditionally it was property, under this kind of John Locke idea of the importance of property rights, but life, liberty, and, and pursuit of happiness, that governments exist by the consent of the governed, and so how can you actually have an environment where you're consenting to the government? That's a very interesting question. And that the government exists to secure our rights, not to provide benefits or create rights. There are pre-existing rights, unalienable rights, that the government has to recognize and protect. Our government today is so far off of that, which is why I think it's so interesting to read the Declaration of Independence, because when you then read the list of grievances, that the Founding Fathers had that justified their separation from Great Britain. And you compare those grievances to similar grievances that many of us may have today, no matter where you land on the political spectrum, it, I think we have so many more severe problems than they had with uh, the British government. But in terms of what go good government looks like, what a community looks like that, that uh, has government that makes sense, that is responsive to people, that is protecting their rights, I mean, it has to be completely limited because when you get this massive government that can do all, be all things to all people and provide them all these benefits, then Jefferson himself talked about this, that when you have this apex of power, right, when the government centralizes so much control and has all these benefits and funding streams and all these different things, the political process becomes literally a battle at the apex of that hill to who can control it. It's, it's, it's the ring. Of, of power, right, and you're trying to fight over who has that ring and then can use it as a weapon against their enemies, that to me is not good government. That's just a weaponized political process that 
that factionizes our country and incentivizes people to see others as the enemy and use the levers of power to oppress them, to get their way. And that is an unhealthy society. I think that's a big problem, which means that you need to decentralize power. You need to take power away from the top. That was the vision of the founders. They wanted a very weak and limited government. They wanted robust local and state governments and individual families uh, controlling the process. And we've completely gone away from that vision. So much power has centralized at the top. And that's why we see such a corrupt and contentious political process today. So to me, the easiest answer is decentralization. Tangentially, it's why I'm a big fan of cryptocurrencies uh, and the blockchain, because this is a technological approach to decentralize power, especially through finance. And uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there to wrest control from the Federal Reserve and some of these other powerful institutions that have s so centralized power over the past century. Hmm. So which of the foundational principles that you've mentioned, or maybe even something that you haven't mentioned, is in most jeopardy today, or is most jeopardized at the moment? Um, Washington had a quote about this. Jefferson also talked about, I mean, most of the Founding Fathers did, but talking about the importance of an informed people to preserve the Republic. You know, that, that, um, that an uneducated people are unfit for self-governance. That when you have ignorant people, they are very easily to, uh, able to be controlled. And, and that those in power and who want to seek power over others want people to be ignorant. They want them to not understand their rights and the dangers to those rights, the wolves in sheep clothing. To me, the greatest threat to kind of these foundational principles is ignorance. It is, we talk about this quote all the time, everyone knows those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Everyone knows that quote, except that, that is like the stupidest quote ever because it's some, it, it in no way has motivated people to do anything any different. Right? Those who do learn from the past are doomed to watch, sit by and watch everyone else <laughs> repeat history for the few that you know, are trying to learn from the past. Our, our curriculum, our teachers, our textbooks, the whole education system is so broken in helping the rising generation learn from the past so as not to, to repeat it. We go through these cyclical problems where people are running into the same issues. Um, and, and I think that is the biggest problem is ignorance. We were starved for, not for information, we're being bombarded with information. It's, it's at our fingertips. We're being inundated with information. What we're starved for is context and the ability to uh, uh, detect patterns, the ability to know who are trusted voices, right? It's, it's the, uh, the boy who cried wolf, right? Or the, uh, how's that go? Um, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? Because I should have learned that second time, except we're being fooled over and over again. You look at the polls that talk about how much distrust there is in the public for the media, and yet that general distrust that people have never leads them to be specifically skeptical about any particular report or story. It's like when people are critical of the school system, but not my school, not my teacher. My kid's teacher is great. My school is great. It's, it's the system that's a problem. But then when everyone thinks that way about their schools, no change happens. I think it's the same way with the media. So many people are distrustful of the media, yet lack the ability to be discerning and skeptical of these specific stories that are completely biased, disinformation, misinformation, and all the rest. And so we go through this cyclical pattern where we generically understand that there are problems. We, we have this generic opposition or distrust in the media, but no... Um, process that enables us to reject or be critical of specific things and so we get led along this path of just being controlled by people who want us to remain ignorant. Hmm. What's the solution then uh, to that problem? <sighs> That's a great question. I wrote a book called Feardom where I talk a little bit about this and um, the hard thing is in the media context, we have to, and, and we're getting there actually. You look at like Substack, Medium before it, but especially Substack now where you have independent journalists. I think one of the best approaches is to not patronize or read or support media institutions. It's to identify specific journalists who have proven themselves trustworthy, who have proven themselves willing to challenge powerful people to go against the shifting cultural narratives. I think of someone like Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he rises to the top for me. This is a guy who comes from the left. Um, during the Bush years, he was very critical of you know, the war on terror and the torture and all this stuff. And then uh, Obama and then Trump. And, and he has been consistent. Even now with President Biden, so many of his uh, kind of liberal 
uh, ideological allies who are journalists are in the tank for Biden and not willing to be critical of anything that he says, even though had Trump done those same things, they would have been extremely critical of it. Yet Glenn Greenwald is losing all kinds of friends because he is a, being very consistent with his journalistic approach to being critical of what Biden is doing. I think it's finding the individuals like that who have proven that they are trustworthy, that they're not the boy who cries wolf. The more we can support individuals rather than these institutions that have all kinds of problems and problematic incentives, um, I think that's the better approach. And platforms like Substack and others are creating economic models where individual journalists can go out on their own, can make their case, uh, receive support directly from the, the people who want to read their material, and then those individual journalists uh, feel less beholden to you know, the editors and the censors and so forth within those institutions. They can say whatever they want and know that they have financial support to be bold and to, uh, do, to say what they think is right. You mentioned trust a couple times. For me, when I think about people I trust, it, it comes down to whether or not they have a commitment to truth. Um, is that something that comes into play for you or how, how do you decide if you trust someone? Is it that they seem to consistent be consistent? Because sometimes you, you need to change. Like you can't be consistent all the time and be dedicated to truth because you know, if you have a scientific approach, things are proven wrong, you have to update your thinking. Um, so what is it for you? How, how do you figure, find these people that you trust? I think it's two parts. One is what you're saying where there's a self, um, what's, what's the word, that when individuals are willing to uh, correct something they previously said or say, hey, I once you know, stated this, but now I've learned this. I think that to me is a sign of intellectual maturity and, and trust, uh, a reason to trust that person because they are willing to admit past error and mistakes rather than kind of defiantly you know, dig in their, their feet and, and defend themselves. So I think that's one. I think the other thing is a, a, a willingness, a demonstrated willingness to be consistent. I think the biggest problem we have, especially in journalism, uh, but in the public more broadly, is inconsistency. It is um, a desire to punish your enemies and hold them to account for all their misdeeds, but to excuse anything and everything, and frankly ignore similar and worse misdeeds that your own team is doing. And so how do I trust people? It's when I see people holding the folks on their own team or in their own ideological camp to account. Mm -hmm. uh, willing to challenge and call out people like, look, I, I share many beliefs with these people or I'm in the same party or whatever, but what they're doing is completely wrong. That independence shows that, that especially in the journalism context, those people are not going to be or, or are less likely perhaps to be swayed by these kind of ideological alliances that they are after truth, that they believe a certain set of values and therefore they are in that ideological camp or whatever, but um, their, their belief in those values does not mean that they're going to excuse the, if anything, it's, it's the, the, the pursuit of those ideals that emboldens these people to hold others in their camp accountable because they know that that bad behavior is a poor reflection on the values that they believe in. And so if anything, it's like, let's purge from my side, like these bad behavior, these bad people, let's get rid of them so that we can continue to uphold these ideals. And I think that's extremely rare. What we see is the natural human tendency to again, want to find every fault with your you know, opponent uh, and just ignore and excuse everything on your side. So the, the relative few who are able to withstand that I think are the ones that I find the most uh, trust in uh, because it shows they've demonstrated, and that doesn't mean they won't make mistakes in the future or fall into similar patterns, but at least at that time of that observation, it's like, hey, I can put a bit of trust in this person because they've given evidence of it. I just think we shouldn't have implicit trust, right? Oh, this new reporter I've never heard of before because he's affiliated with you know, CBS or BuzzFeed or you know, the New Yorker or whatever, I'm gonna trust this random person I've never met before because of the you know, imprint and brand of this institution. If anything, it should be the opposite. We should distrust these institutions, be skeptical of these no-name people until we have evidence for you know, seeing that we have reason to trust those people. I, I agree. I think I've come to the same conclusion. Today, it's more of, it's less about institutions and more about individuals and, mm -hmm. and their voice within that institution. Um, so that concludes our wise up section. We're going to move on to suit up. And suit up is all about presentation. It's all about preparation, style, plans, goals. 
um, that can help us be successful as individuals, communities, and nations. So, question for you, why do you think that politicians are always suited up? We judge books by their cover. We might say we don't want to, we might say that's a bad idea, but um, the outward appearance is an indicator, it's a signal to people. The way the brain works is um, it wants to conserve calories. It takes shortcuts. It's why peer pressure and social dynamics are so strong. It's why um, there was this one s story in the 80s on this TV show, uh, they had this hidden camera. And this woman was in this little um, uh, waiting room for an eye doctor. She stopped in because there was a sign saying, free exam. She goes in there and she's waiting, she's filling her paperwork and this beep sounds. And the two people sitting next to her who were there before her stand up and sit down. She looks at them like, that's weird. And you know, a few minutes later, again. So again, they stand up and sit down. Then someone new walks in, they get their paperwork, they sit down, they start filling it out, beep goes off again. The two previous people and the new person stand up and sit down. This lady's like, what is going on? Again and again and again. Pretty soon she starts standing up and sitting down every time the beep goes off. Of course, as you might imagine, this whole thing is a hidden camera, everyone is in on it, they're all actors except for this woman. But it shows how we take our cues from other people and how uh, the brain is, is, rather than thinking critically and really kind of holding firm to things, we look f to other people for cues about how we should behave. The brain wants to conserve calories. If it can take shortcuts by learning uh, from other people um, so that we don't have to evaluate or think anymore, it's going to do that. So that's where appearance folds in, right? If we, rather than have to talk to a person and evaluate them and interview them and ask them all kinds of questions, if we can form a, a snap judgment, and come to a conclusion, even an intermediate conclusion about someone based on appearances, our brains like that because they're wired to look for those shortcuts. So we can either begrudge that or say how awful that is, or we can lean into it and say, because I want to cast a favorable oppression, if I'm a politician and I want votes and I want people to like me, of course I shouldn't look like a slob. Of course I should look like the very people like who I want, you know, if I have tattoos and green hair and everything else and I'm in a, you know, in the Bible belt, you know, with all these like Christians and whatnot, probably I'm not going to win a lot of support. I want to look like the people, I, I want them to feel like I'm one of them. That's a big problem, of course, because people who are conniving, um, who want to abuse that system and take advantage of people, obviously it's the, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? I, if I say things like my audience or look like them or whatever, I'm going to deceive them a bit into thinking like I'm like them and they'll give me their power and then I can go abuse that power. Um, but notwithstanding that abuse, it is a process I think that we can um, beneficially take advantage of in just having good appearance in trying to show other people that we're not a threat, that we're not a slob, that we are someone worth talking to and having a relationship. And so at just a very base level, I think appearance is important. So we, we do it as a time-saving uh, mechanism, and that would imply that it's kind of been passed down. It's almost like this tradition of necktie suit. It, it just it, it stays because that's been the uniform of successful people for a while. Perhaps so, you know, tradition, right? Like we just kind of have that going on. And, and that's not to say, like some days I'll, you know, not do a tie, you go for the more casual look. and. But just, you know, being clean shaven and having even good speaking mannerisms, body language, confidence that you're projecting. Um, I don't know that, um, you know, you must check a box and have every single thing. But overall, like the overall appearance has to be at a point where people aren't just going to tune you out because they think that you're weird. Yeah, I mean, even Donald Trump came down the escalator with his, you know, knee length necktie. And I was like, is that going to get stuck in there? That could, <laughs> you know, I could change history. Necktie stuck in the escalator. Um, so anyways, suits, ties, uh, and other dress for men often have something, uh, some personal meaning. Um, it's not often that some man will see some like accessory on a shelf and be like, oh, I really like that accessory. It's usually some, it has some meaning to that accessory. Is there anything like that for you that comes to mind? Like something that you wear on a special occasion, mm -hmm. not just a wedding ring, although that is one example of this. I've got two things. One is my granddad's necktie. He is deceased, and so that has personal meaning for, or my, excuse me, the tie tack. Um, and so I wear that for especially family occasions and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is, I mean, I grew up, my, my parents did not know much about style. Let's put it that way. Um, especially when you look at those pictures growing up in the 80s and 90s, it was horrible style. Uh, 
And, and so when I started, you know, dressing up for church and for meetings and work and so forth, I, everything was ill-fitted. I mean, I was, I was, you know, you, going to the Sears or whatever, buying the folded shirt, just sitting there, and, and they never know, like, okay, does the person with this size have massive biceps or skinny biceps? Of course, I'm a scrawny little kid, and so I'm, I'm drowning in fabric here that's just massive, and it's all wrinkled. It just looks horrible. And so it wasn't until about five or six years ago that I, I really came to the realization that it looked awful. Like I was dressing up, but it just it didn't look good. And so I started uh, getting fitted shirts and suits and uh, have never looked back. It's been amazing. I feel like I'm, I'm uh, being hugged all the time. It, it feels like it gives me more confidence rather than me like feeling like I'm in some big boy's clothing that I borrowed a hand-me-down or yeah. something. Like it feels Get in like- in the way it, it, it in, encourages your action instead of yeah. getting in the way of it. Absolutely. It, 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 as silly as it is, it's a little bit of a confidence boost. I have, more particularly to your question, I have one suit that is a shiny silver suit. Uh, and I wear that on the first and last day of the legislative session when we're up at the Capitol. It's kind of my little tradition now that I've created. And then I wear it to any awards ceremony. So recently our, our team won a national award for um, this policy that we did. And so I wore that suit there. Whenever it's kind of like a recognition event, I wear that kind of power suit. Just uh, that's, type, uh, that's kind of my thing now. That's awesome. Do you follow anybody uh, that gives style tips, or do you have any books you've read or anything? I, I don't, lines? no. I, I hired a consultant a few years ago to help me kind of initially and kind of figure things out, and I've just kind of continued on my own down that vein. I would probably benefit from doing more of that, but, um, but it was a good first investment for me to just get some critical feedback and do a wardrobe reset, and then uh, have something I could continue with. Any faux pas for the audience, like things that people shouldn't do when dressing up? You know, I, I think that I loved, <laughs> when I was uh, in college, I would wear the big fat uh, polyester ties from the 70s. I, I, for some reason, really loved those, and I had to get rid of those eventually. Um, and, you know, I think, obviously, the pattern clashing, if you're wearing, like, a suit with a big pattern and a shirt with a big pattern, that never looks good. Um, I think I think too many people are too traditional with their kind of conservative approaches. I have some fun suits, one that's purple, one that's crazy outfit. Like, granted, if your personality isn't a match, then maybe stick to like the conservative options. But for me, I like showing up to a meeting with like a you know bright yellow belt with you know yellow socks, or have some fun with it so that you can kind of. Uh, to me, I mean, style it's really an expression of yourself, and so. If you do have a little bit of that personality, like today, I'm wearing Captain America socks, uh, right? That's part of my brand, you know, and, and being patriotic and so forth. So I feel like uh, too many people pursue a very narrow subset of what style is, and they get very kind of traditional, and they just take whatever's off the shelf uh, versus maybe going a custom approach, even if it's just for a tie or socks or, you know, a shirt or whatever to say, like, what, what would you know, best reflect my style and who I am? And, and they're conversation starters too. How many times have I been sitting in a meeting, I cross my leg and someone comments about my sock or I'm wearing a tie that has you know, our organization's logo. I got a custom tie that has our colors and our logo. And people are like, oh, that's cool, what's that? Now I've got a hook to talk about what I do and who I am. Um, so I think being expressive like that with our style I think is also important. Nice. I couldn't have said it better. Um, I, that is so true that Style should be a reflection of who you are. There are, and there are some rules that you have to know so you don't make those big mistakes. Um, but within that realm, uh, it's all about that. So I, I actually have a tie for you. Let me see which one it is. It's it's this one. This is um, this is a, a tie for you. And by the way, this is the debut of this tie. Um, it's called Voice. The name of this tie is Voice. And uh, it's part of our freedom of speech line nice. of neckties. So there's a symbol on this. It's a, a chat box. It's a barbed wire chat box with a bird breaking through. Mm. Um, and this is, like I said, part of our freedom of speech line. So that one's Love it. yours. They're very high quality. Thank and you. by the way, that's one of two. So that could be a collector's item someday. Who knows? Nice. But uh, so it's... it's um, all of our ties in the future, they have uh, very high quality silk or polyester, uh, thick inner lining that gives you a nice good knot. Um, they're all self-tipped, which means that they don't have two pieces of fabric 
on the tip. And this particular tie is waterproofed. Oh, wow. So nice. Uh, I, quick story. I, my son, I gave him one of these ties. Within 20 minutes, we were at church. And he gets a bloody nose. And not only does he get a bloody nose, but it like splats oh, no. all over <laughs> his tie. So I'm like, I guess we'll see if this waterproof thing works. So I took a, a piece of uh, tissue and I just dabbed it on the tie. Mm -hmm. And it took it all off. If I showed you this tie today, you, you would not be able to tell. I dabbed the blood off. If I showed you this tie, you would not be able to see the blood on it. I can see it because there's like a little dot right in one of the, mm. the, the bird pieces of fabric, but I think if I took some water to it, it would it's go impressive. away. So, so yeah, waterproof is, is the way to go these days for the ties. Anyways, I wanted you to have that Thank because you, you are uh, a bastion of freedom of speech um, and freedoms in general. I like it. I would imagine. Almost so. looks like the Mockingjay a little bit. Kind of reminds me of that freedom symbol. Yeah. Very cool. So I've been teaching people how to tie ties since 2007. I've, uh, thanks to YouTube, I've taught over 50 million people to tie a tie. So I have to ask you, what necktie knot do you use? Do you know the name of the necktie knot? Oh you gosh, I, I'm not a tie expert. Um, I think it's, is it the, the double Windsor where you kind of go around and then you go around? Yep. So is, is that what this looks like? That okay. I don't that do does look like a double Windsor. It also looks like several other knots. But if if you go around twice, then it definitely is. Then it's that one. The double Windsor. Do you know any other knots? Or um, I used to do the single back in the day, but I, I never liked how that kind of looked, kind of lopsided. Okay. Um, my I, dad. Uh, I'm not a bow tie guy. I learned at one point how to do bow ties, uh, but that's not really my style. Um, and then at one point, my dad taught me a different kind of cool, fancy not uh i don't remember what it was called and anyways but i i don't uh i don't know many well you can tell a lot by the necktie knot someone uses so for instance if you don't know a necktie knot you're probably a woman um no offense to to women uh or you're a hippie so you could be a hippie <laughs> or a, a, a woman or you should go check out our channel and learn how to tie a tie um if you choose the double windsor that's actually the most traditional it's mm. symmetrical uh, most people know that it's also a little childish and that's not an insult. That's not an insult. It's just that it uses a lot of knot. Uh, so it's great for kids because their ties are usually too long. So mm. because of that double loop, um, a, a couple other knots, I think you mentioned the, the off center one, that one's called the four in hand okay. knot. And that one's actually a little, it has a little mystique. That's actually a somewhat political knot. It has some political history to it. Uh, back in England. Um, and then if you want to be a little more uh, rakish, I guess, maybe would be a word for it, you could uh, choose like an Eldridge knot or a Trinity knot. Those have kind of Trinity, patterns within. that's the one my dad taught me. Yeah, patterns within. the. We actually have a necktie that's great for the Trinity. So mm. uh, stripes are great for the Trinity what knot. Are you, what's the knot that you have right now? This is the half Windsor. Half so Windsor. I think you called it the single Windsor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the half. half. Got it. Yeah, so I, I like the half. I, I wear it a lot. Um, another knot is the Nikki knot. If you want to tie your tie quicker or if your tie is too short sometimes and the double Windsor takes too much length, you could try the Nikki knot or the half Windsor. Hmm. So we're running out of time, but we're going to jump into the last section of our meeting, which is stand up. So we wise up, we suit up, and now we stand up. Uh, this section is all about what are we going to do now? You know, we're, we're wise. We, we understand the principles by which we should operate as men. Um, we're prepared. And what are we going to do? And you mentioned earlier in, when, in one of your answers that action is so important to success. And that's what this section is all about. So um, it also, so anyways, how can the gentleman wise, which is what we call the community on this channel, how can the gentleman wise help you in your life's work? How can we help you help others? I, I think what's really important is recognizing that division of labor is, is a thing. What does that mean? It means not everyone's going to do or should do what I do. Not everyone should run for office. Not everyone should go build a business. People have different paths in life. And so I think we need to give ourselves permission to not have to be as engaged as Connor is and all the things. But we can support one another, whether you know, patronizing their business or 
going to their event or being on their email list and spreading the word or whatever. What we rely on for our organization and so many organizations like us across the country is having behind us an army of supporters so that when there is an action alert, when there is something critical happening, there are people who are informed, they you know, have expressed an intent to say, when you need me, let me know, and they're willing to dedicate a little bit of time to taking action. Maybe it's going to you know, a certain city council meeting, maybe it's writing your elected official, maybe it's writing a letter to the editor, um, but when we have people kind of raise their hand and say, hey, look, I'm over here building my business or, I, you know, a lot of family time or whatever, whatever, but I want to help you, right? The more of those people that kind of identify themselves when we need them and we know they're there, we can put them to work for something that's very kind of specific and actionable. Um, and so what does that mean? That means, you know, as simple as going to an organization you support and joining their email list. It means going to one of their events, shoot them an email and say, hey, I have this specific talent to offer. I don't have a lot of time, but could you use this? You know, we get a lot of stuff like that, uh, people who volunteer. Um, again, it doesn't mean you have to come work here. You have to get an internship or anything like that, but, but just reach out to these organizations, mine or so many of them across the country, and say, I like what you're doing. I mean, obviously, like, donating helps if it's a nonprofit that's trying to do some of this stuff. Um, that's critical. But beyond the financial support, it's just general support of saying, I'm here if you ever need me. Here's my specific background. And we, we catalog that sometimes. It's like, hey, this guy you know, has a distribution business and he does X, Y, and Z. You file that away and then maybe two years from now there's a specific need that we can go you know, back to and have that guy in our network to, to help us out. Um, but really I think standing up really just means like being engaged. And what do I mean by that? It means um, too easy, too often it's easy for people to be passive in their lives about the world that's happening around them. Things are moving quick, they're uncertain, they're chaotic. And so people are often are just like, eh, I'm not gonna pay attention, I'm gonna focus on me and my family. And I totally get it, completely, completely understand it. However, I feel like what we need are far more engaged people who, even if they're not engaged as someone like me, full time, um, they are paying attention to what's going on, they know a problem when they see it, and they know who they can turn to for help when they want to step up and say, I don't like that that's happening. I want to be part of the solution. You know, how can I help? Too many people just disengage completely and disconnect from what's happening. And going back to our earlier part of the conversation, I feel like the more that happens with ignorant people and disengaged people, it allows those in power who want to abuse their power to do so more easily because people are apathetic and you know, plugged into their phones and not paying attention to the world around them. And I just think that leads to a, a worse outcome. We just need more informed and engaged people. Yeah. So one thing that you do every year is a children's entrepreneur market. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was pretty cool. It's connected to your lemonade stand laws here in Utah where you made it easier for kids to start a business. So I think what it is is you set up a market and let them come. Any uh, backstory on that? Or? Yeah. So um, we, we do these every year, about a dozen markets across the state of Utah. In other states, there's a group called the Acton Children's Business Fair, which does something similar on a more limited basis. Uh, but it's like a farmer's market, except run entirely by the kids. So mom or dad will come help set up, uh, but the kids are required to do all the pitching and negotiating and exchange of money and, you know, haggling and all that kind of fun stuff. Let me ask you, what's the wildest thing that's been sold at one of these? The wildest thing? Or the most interesting or um, something that I, sticks out? I mean, you got a lot of similar stuff, a lot of food, a lot of shirts and games and crafts and, and so forth. Um, I, uh, you get some really innovative kids. You get one kid, like Among Us has been a popular game in the past year, so you had a kid who created 3D printed Among Us stuff and sold a ton of stuff. You get a girl who uh, was doing 15 minute ukulele lessons and she'd teach you one song on the ukulele and then you could buy a ukulele or just do, I thought that was really creative. Hmm. You get, you know, a few years ago you get fidget spinners and like a dozen kids are all selling fidget spinners and now it's all <laughs> slime and you get nice. a lot of stuff like that. But uh, but it's fun, we let kids sell whatever they want. And I remember my kids, they sold fidget spinners a few years ago, and then the kid right across from them set up uh, their booth and were also selling fidget spinners. My kids were selling them for $5, the other kid was selling them for $4. And that was great because these markets that we put on aren't just for kids to make money, they're educational experiences. So I had the opportunity to sit down with my kids and say, how many do you think you're gonna sell now? Oh, none, They're, everyone's gonna go. Okay, so what should you do? Well, we gotta lower our prices. 
how low can you go, right, to still have a profit? And how can you try and compete? How can you create fidget spinners with a twist or add something more valuable so people still buy from you? So it's just a great opportunity for kids to have the profit motive start to work for them, to have a little bit of competition around. Because when a kid sets up a lemonade stand down the road, they got no competition. Everyone driving by who sees a cute kid is just like, here, kid, take my money. Yeah. But when you put them in a, a line of tons of other booths of kids selling stuff, you get that competition element that requires kids to kind of step up a little bit and engage people. Um, again, just giving them that educational opportunity to start to learn some of those values. That's cool. Do I have any uh, menswear accessory competitors in the? We've had uh, we've had some some teens selling shirts, selling some ties. Uh, I think that's more rare. Um, uh, so yeah, we we we. I think only once or twice I've seen anyone selling any tie uh, products. But uh, sometimes you get like cufflinks and tie tacks and things like that too. Well, we're running out of time. I just got a couple other couple questions for you more. Um, what advice do you have for people that want to make a difference in politics? You mentioned a little bit, um, but a lot of people these days, they feel powerless. Um, and you're someone that has been able to, to make a difference. What, what's your best advice? Um, the, the best advice I've ever given that I think people can actually see the results of is take a legislator to lunch. Or it could be a mayor or a city councilor or whoever you want to kind of build a relationship with. Politics, political change is all about relationships. And so offer to take a legislator to lunch. Um, especially helpful if you're affiliated with any organization or if you're a delegate or a community leader or activist, right? Because otherwise if you're a random Joe, do they really want to spend time meeting you? But often they do, especially at the more local levels of government. Offer to take them out to lunch so that they can talk about some of their priorities and you can share yours. Um, do a town hall meeting in your home. Say, hey, I'd love to have you come speak to you know, 20 people at my home and we'll have refreshments and you can, especially if they're running for re-election or anything like that, they're going to want to talk to people and suddenly you're perceived by that elected official as a leader, as someone who can organize people. Um, simple, simple things like that to start to build relationships. Go to, to meetings. Like once you've built that relationship with that person, go to their next meeting. Go say hi to them after, reconnect and say, hey, it was great meeting with you. And they may be like, oh, hey, let me introduce you to this person. Suddenly you've met a second person. It's just all about networking and building relationships, putting in that little bit of time and going to those meetings or soliciting a meeting. And I've seen a lot of people do that with great success. And then by investing in that relationship, when the time comes months or years later for you to try and persuade that person, say, hey, there's this tax thing going on or this regulation or whatever, you've now got a relationship that you can leverage to have that person hopefully help you with whatever your problem is. It's a great way, very simple way for people to get involved is just start creating some of those very limited relationships and then see where it blossoms. Nice. Well, the Salt Lake Tribune said that you can get things done by seemingly lifting a finger. So I came up with a comic book series for you, the libertarian superhero Connor Boyack. By day he wears a suit and tie, by night he puts on spandex suit, shaves his beard, and wait for it, he lifts a finger. <laughs> Watch out, everyone. Exactly. My kids will like that you had him shave his beard. They keep telling me I need to shave mine, so we'll see. What's, what's next for you? Uh, what, what do you want us to think about or promote? Or Yeah. I, I think uh, what's next for us is just more of the same. We're going to keep doing more Tuttle Twins books. We're going to keep doing the Tuttle Twins cartoon, which comes out very soon. Um, and we're going to keep putting out additional episodes and seasons. That one is going to go big and wide. And so I think that would be the big thing. TuttleTwins.tv is where people can find that. Uh, the trailer's on YouTube as well. And uh, we're very excited for that to come. So we're going to lean into that and really try and blow it up. Nice. And last question, now that you kind of get a sense for our mission and vision, is does anyone come to mind that is maybe championing the cause or uh, has a great story or insp inspiring insights related to Wise Up, Suit Up, and Speak Up? Does anyone come to mind that, that maybe that you would recommend for an interview with us? Do you mean here in Utah or anywhere? Else in the yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll say, yes, I have people in mind, but it'll take my mind a, a while to catch up. And what I mean by that is my wife will often say, hey, what do you want? What should I make for dinner? Or what, you know, where should we go? And my mind goes blank, even though I know tons of things. So I'm bad with questions like this right now. And I know if you give me some time, I'll think of some people. But off the cuff, I get like, 
paralysis of like, oh, I can't think of anyone. <laughs> That's okay. So, so put me on the spot. That's I do okay. poorly, but give me some time. I can definitely refer some people your way. All right. Well, if any, if you have any names, even if you don't know them, but you're like, I just know this person, you know, they're wise, you know, they're, they, they have some, uh, some, even if they don't have knowledge on suiting up, but um, they're action oriented people. Uh, those are, those are the people that we're looking for cool. for interviews. So Anyways, Connor, thank you so much. Thank you for Thanks coming. For and thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we'll uh, we'll be back at you next month with another interview. And um, with that, this has been signing out.